So tonight we're going to talk about community energy development and the role of small scale energy systems. I'm going to talk about why cities are at the forefront of the discussion around climate change and energy conservation. And I'll provide some context and examples of what the city of Surrey is doing. Um, and then I'll turn it over to our panelists. And uh, we've got four fantastic presenters this evening. Uh, we have Robin Work from BC Hydro, and Robin's going to discuss how and why local governments and BC Hydro are advancing clean energy in BC. Um, I'll share with you, it's because we don't want to pay more. <laughs> uh, the second um, speaker is going to be Sandy Ferguson, and Sandy's from the BC Bioenergy Network. And Sandy's going to continue with an overview of municipal bioenergy developments in BC and challenges and opportunities moving forward. And then Kristen Muka. Thank you, okay. Um, from Fortis, BC, we'll talk about integrated energy solutions. And finally, Anna Matheson um, from the City of Surrey will speak to district energy system being built within the city and some of our community energy and emission plan activities. So, with that, uh, so for me over the next 10 minutes, and uh, therefore for you over the next 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to talk about these three things, cities and energy, the three context, and then our energy shift program uh, that we have underway in the city. Um, and I'll summarize this slide by saying there's a lot of energy that's consumed in cities, and it's growing. Um, and not necessarily um, uh, the right kind of growth based on more and more of the same. Um, so continuing down the same path looks a lot better on this screen than what you're seeing there. Imagine it better. Um, continuing down the same path isn't going to produce the right results, so we need to alter course and direction. I'd say that uh, necessity is the mother of invention, and I'll correlate that to the city of Surrey in a second. So according to the UN in 2008, um, over half the world's population um, was living in cities uh, for the first time ever. Um, and Cities are being burdened by more and more responsibilities, and responsibilities that are being, uh, I'll say, downloaded from different levels of government. And um, there's no kind of further downloading once you hit uh, the city context. And having learned over the past couple of years that uh, we're expensive, residents are expensive, um, more and more growth uh, in a city from a residential perspective isn't necessarily accretive to the city's bottom line. Um, and with the additional responsibilities, it actually becomes a more, more and more challenging. So I go back to necessity is the mother of invention. We have to do things differently in order to make sure that taxes don't go up. Um, because we have to pay the services somehow. So we either get more money coming in or figure out how to do it faster, better, cheaper. Um, so right now there's an imbalance between what we provide and what we do and the revenue stream coming in. So one of my responsibilities at the city is investment, not necessarily where the city invests, but how to attract investment uh, into the city. And, and also how to drive uh, incremental change in the city so that we can do things differently and better and support companies that are trying to drive change. So we have an opportunity to change and what and how we do uh, is going to uh, really influence um, the community that I live in, that we live in, uh, the broader community context, certainly. So, we are a type of laboratory. Um, as Elmer had suggested, we can implement ideas at a small local scale, prove them out, prove them out, and then move on, um, and allow those technologies and those companies to prosper and go on to uh, bigger and better things. This, uh, this slide really talks to the fact that cities are relevant again, um, and there's a renewed interest in cities. And um, I, I, I think this is the case based on the fact that what, is, what cities do um, really touches the lives of, of every single person. Um, there's a little less context when you get to the provincial level, and certainly a lot less context at the national level. There's more policy-based decisions. Um, but with a city, it's all very tangible. And you know, you look at, uh, we're working with IBM right now on the Smarter Cities Challenge. Uh, we were awarded uh, one of the, uh, I think two, Mike, was it two in Canada? Yeah, yeah two in Canada. Um, that were awarded a uh, $400,000 grant to work with IBM um, in the Smarter Cities Challenge. And we're working with them on early childhood development indicators, trying to pr um, create more productive citizens down the road by changing what we do today. Um, you look at Cisco, and, and they've been involved in 
um, the Toronto waterfront, so, uh, where they've invested, uh, I think it's upwards of a billion dollars in networking capabilities to make the city more connected and smarter. Um, Google's trying to figure out uh, data centers and get into a zero net consumption or, or actual producing energy out of the data centers rather than consuming. I used to have responsibilities for some data centers to tell us, and I know I can tell you that getting to that point is tough. So why is that relevant for a city? Cities, surprisingly, uh, have data centers. So how can these companies uh, leverage what they do on a day-to-day -day basis with cities? Um, just in this region alone, uh, Metro Band is, I think it's 21 or 22 different cities. So a lot of opportunities for big companies. This, uh, this slide really is um, about on your left-hand side, um, what used to be done in development. Um, it's super new. Um, no density, um, there's, you won't see any kind of real transit there unless it rolls on wheels. And uh, greening is perhaps the, uh, the hummer on the, uh, the bottom left there, which isn't necessarily a green vehicle. Um, on the right, it's about densification and uh, building and developing different neighborhoods and, uh, and how a city goes about developing will truly influence um, um, uh, health, as an example. If we build a city where it's walkable and bikeable, you'll have better health outcomes down the road, leading to an improved scenario for us as a community with rising healthcare costs. Um, if you build dense communities that are transit oriented, we have less vehicles on the road, less need for more and more infrastructure, which is incredibly expensive. Diverting that to other social programs, which are better for society at large. So again, we have an opportunity to do things in the right way, um, as opposed to continuing to do uh, what we've done in the past. Uh, a few slides on kind of the Surrey context. From a geographic perspective, Surrey's pretty large. You can fit Vancouver, Richmond, and uh, Burnaby within Surrey. So a large geographic region. Um, we've had rapid population growth. Um, we're the second largest city by population in, in the province. We're the third fastest growing in Canada. Um, and uh, with no signs of, of slowing down. And as I said before, that has significant cost implications. More people, more services, more cost burden to the city. Um, so we have to kind of change what and how we do. Uh, but there's also an opportunity. So we have an opportunity to influence how people uh, conduct activities on a day-to-day -day basis. We have an opportunity to influence 500,000 people by simple policy changes. And I'll get into a couple of them. Um, because policy changes are sometimes uh, have a negative perception and that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Um, so I'll get into a couple of them um, in a minute. Uh, this slide, it's uh, top left, it's the faces of Surrey. Um, we've got a young population. 30% um, of our population is 19 or younger. Uh, I believe that we have 70,000 uh, kids in, or students in uh, K-12. It's the largest and the only growing school district in the province. And I believe the stat is um, uh, one in two high school students will be graduating from the city of Surrey in the next, it's a short amount of time, if not right now. Um, so one in two graduates are going to be from Surrey. Um, a third of our land is agricultural land, uh, so it's protected land, and that becomes important from a food security policy and perhaps a bioenergy uh, policy as well. And the city has 50% of the available, or almost 50% of the available vacant land um, in Metro Vancouver is, is within the city. So opportunities for growth, but again, smart growth and the, and, uh, the right type of growth. So on to um, our energy shift program. So this is about taking action in the community and our corporate operations and in business. Um, and this, uh, we put this together, I, I'm going to say over the last two years because I've been with the city two years and it wasn't there when I started and it is now. So over the last two years, um, and, and the intent of this was to take a number of different programs that we had in our way and consolidate them into a single framework touching three pillars, supported by and underpinned by our sustainability charter. Um, so I'll talk to uh, I'll talk to each of these um, to a certain extent, um, and and our program and our approach was recognized by the Clean Energy Association of BC, um, and we were awarded the Community of the Year award for our multidisciplinary approach to sustainability and energy conservation. So I'll talk to each of these uh, in a second. Um, so I'll use City Centre as an example. So City Centre is the red dot. <laughs> Um, yeah, so northeast uh, end of the city, and it's it's where if you've been on SkyTrain, it's where it ends. 
Um, this is a this is a view of city center. Um, we're right now um, going through a transformation, and uh, we're creating from the picture on the left of suburbia to the picture on the right with the density from a previous slide. We're going to a very high dense area. Um, we're increasing the, the grid network um, within the region so that um, there is more and more people and more movements and simpler movements and walkable and, and uh, um, uh, uh, cycling. Uh, based uh, network. Uh, the population here is projected to double over about the next 15 years. Um, 4,000 new homes have been built there, in the, or uh, I'd say high density homes have been built there in the last uh, decade. And there's no signs of abatement. There's about um, 40 projects underway right now, so there's a lot, so, well, you don't see them here, there's a lot of um, uh, cranes that are um, there building buildings. Um, this is our, and so the city, the private sector is investing a lot of money and the city is investing a lot of money. So what you see here is, uh, is our library, new library in city centre and uh, just, you know, I guess it would be on, uh, well this is looking south, so on the north side of this is going to be the new city hall. Um, so we're putting efforts into densifying an area by putting more and more people there. Um, turning to the uh, um, uh, biofuel facility, um, this is, uh, we're basically developing a biofuel facility and we're going to produce fuel from the waste um, that is created within the city. And the waste is, and the fuel is going to be used to fuel our, our uh, fleet vehicles. Um, last year, or earlier this year, the city signed a, um, a new waste collection contract. Um, and this is significant because we've actually mandated that rather than having diesel vehicles, uh, collecting all of the, the garbage, it's CNG vehicles, and that's important because for every vehicle that we um, uh, is swapped from diesel to CNG, it's the equivalent of taking 470 vehicles off the road um, every year. Um, and we're actually going to be using the garbage to fuel um, the garbage trucks as well, which is uh, relatively unique. And finally, I'll, I'll wrap up with the Clean Tech Commercialization Center, and this is kind of the for business side. Um, the, uh, Elmer had mentioned that uh, he was on the Mayor's Clean Energy Advisory Network, and, and through this network, um, and working with SFU, BC Hydro, and PowerTech, we signed an LOI in kind of circa 2008-ish, no, 2010 time frame, sorry, and uh, with one of the, um, uh, the mandates to create a, um, an environment that's going to foster growth in the clean tech sector. Um, so, working with our partners, um, we've envisioned a, a Clean Tech Commercialization Center, C3, and the intent of this is in downtown uh, in city center, um, in close proximity, in fact, across the street from SFU and potentially in one of the SFU buildings that they're contemplating, is to provide a, a facility for business mentorship, innovation, training, um, as well as uh, lab equipment and the ability to rapid prototype. So taking something that would normally be 18 months to three years and providing all of the facilities and solutions in one location to bring that down to three months to 12 months. Um, and then all of the business support services around it so the companies can go and they can be successful. They'll be integrated, they have an opportunity to integrate what they're doing with research that's being done at SFU. So you can go from applied research to commercialization within an area. And then fortunately we have plans to help companies grow as well. So I've just been given almost the hook here, so um, which you can't see. I went from a green to a red card. Red necessarily is bad sometimes. So, um, so that's uh, that's about a wrap for me. So thank you for letting me share a few uh, things that we're doing within the city. Um, now, one thing I've been asked to do is just kind of get it from a show of hands, uh, answer a few questions on where people are from. Um, so from a clean energy company, show of hands. Okay, so someone's rapidly tabulating right now. Um, okay, so uh, from government, that's me. Excellent public sector employees here late at night. Um, from the university. Very good, okay. Um, private sector. I'm going to have to assume it's almost everybody else. There we go. Uh, and then how many people are living in Vancouver? Okay, and then how many came from out of town? Okay, and who wants to go in Surrey? I do. <laughs> <There we go. laughs> okay, um, never get kind of shit up enough there, right? 
I'm allowed to plug the story in. There we go. So uh, my other few slides today are on uh, my observations on why BC communities are interested in policy and clean energy projects. Uh, so I'm with a group called Sustainable Communities, and our role is to work with communities to design and build more energy efficient communities. So we co-fund uh, 12 community energy managers working within local governments around the province, including uh, one at Surrey and a uh, couple in Vancouver, and um, I'm not sure what other communities we have represented here, but it's been a terrific partnership for BC Hydro to have a staff who are working within local government to advance uh, energy conservation and clean energy projects. We also co-fund community energy emissions plans. Uh, we've co-funded about 30 across the province, including one again in Surrey. Uh, we're currently starting, about to start up in uh, Burnaby, some in Richmond, um, and elsewhere within the, um, within the, the mainland. So through that work, we've had a chance to really work with local government and understand uh, what's motivating them to get involved in these clean energy projects. Uh, and I think we have seen a real shift uh, over the last three or four years, the local governments who are interested in advancing clean energy projects. And I thought like I'd spend my ten minutes or so here uh, just sharing some observations from my experience on what's motivating local governments to get involved in these projects. So first of all, I just want to talk about the partnership that we have with local government. It's, it's kind of a unique partnership because BC Hydro isn't looking to own and operate clean energy systems at a, at a, at a small scale. Um, however, we are interested in working with local governments and communities when they're looking to advance projects, if there's electrical savings, or if they're looking to uh, look at generation projects to be able to direct them to the appropriate uh, electricity purchasing uh, policies or, or um, mechanisms. And sometimes it's not just the two of us around the table, there's, there's a third. Uh, so sometimes local governments want to own and operate uh, these community energy systems, uh, and other times they want to look at a utility partner. So it's great we've got someone like Kristen here uh, from Terrison, uh, there's, sorry, from Fortis. Uh, there's also Corex and, and other utilities that are looking to uh, um, own and operate these systems. So sometimes uh, there's, there's several partners who are in the room. And when I Googled partner for, for an image, I found this one. And uh, I, I love the image. It just, I don't know what they were doing and who was who in that in the partnership that we have, whether it's the blind leading the blind or uh, us encouraging each other to do things that uh, we think we should be doing. And it reminded me of uh, our old CEO, Bob Elton, when he talked about what our role as BC Hydro was from energy conservation. So his vision is, and our vision is, to promote a culture of conservation within British Columbia. And he said, you know, we shouldn't always be at the forefront in preaching the message. We've got to look at other leaders like local governments to be taking leadership. And our role is to lead from behind. Uh, so maybe we sometimes think that about us pushing. Um, but I thought this, uh, this image is a good one. So I've got, I just want to talk about four reasons why, in our, our observations, local government have been really keen in advancing uh, clean energy projects and seeing that as part of their future. Uh, the first and perhaps most obvious one, uh, especially in recent years, has been climate action. And if you take somewhere like the city of Vancouver, who's been so remarkably successful at actually getting uh, uh, reductions in GHGs within their community, especially compared with uh, our lack of progress at a, at a national level, for example. And so the city of Vancouver set out their greenhouse gas action plan and have actually met their, uh, their 2012 targets uh, of actually reducing that um, uh, carbon trend while they still got population growth. So they still got a growing economy, a growing population, but they've bent down the carbon trend. And when they look across the city about what some of the biggest opportunities are uh, in the future for reducing greenhouse gases, they're looking at some of the, the large emitters. Um, so you've got a downtown district energy system which is using uh, natural gas, you've got some of the hospitals and universities. And what's the opportunities for some of those uh, district energy systems to look at renewable sources? Uh, so there's a, a big interest uh, from certain cities to look at uh, renewable energy in uh, sort of a clean tech context to be able to help drive down uh, those greenhouse gas emissions. There's also some interest if you look at uh, combined heat and power from BC Hydro's perspective. Uh, so often when we see um, uh, electricity generation, it's happening often 
the more remote areas in, in uh, British Columbia, but where there's not an opportunity to recapture waste heat. So, for example, we've got bioenergy. Uh, you've got about 70% of that energy when you're doing bioenergy that goes off into the atmosphere as waste heat. If, however, we're able to integrate that at a local level within communities, there's an opportunity to be able to recapture that 70%. Uh, waste heat and be using it for heating purposes and to offset, for example, electric baseboards. So there's some really interesting win-wins if we can marry those two things together. Second big, big motivator, and uh, this won't be a surprise to people, is around uh, green jobs. And we see that in communities from uh, throughout the province, from, uh, we got one there from Campbell River, uh, CS Surrey, so the Forward, Dawson Creek, uh, Port Alberni, City of Vancouver. Uh, it's a big motivator for a lot of communities. How can we get clean tech into our communities to drive green jobs? And local governments see themselves as actually having quite a, a strong role to be able to advance that. Uh, so we look at Mayor's Task Force. Um, Sean referred to that, but we also see one in Vancouver, Whistler, Colwood, Campbell River. Mayor saying, how can I work with business leaders, uh, with chains of commerce, uh, with universities to be able to drive clean tech jobs into my community? Uh, we see that political leadership has been really very helpful for staff as they're trying to you know, do their individual action plans below. Uh, we also see a, a number of other tools that they can use from uh, clean energy branding on economic development plans, potential tax incentives to locate within their community, uh, projects like technology incubators or tech parks, uh, demonstration neighborhoods. We, we often find that communities are, um, are loath to do things on a community-wide basis, but they're really interested in doing demo projects at a neighborhood scale. We think that's a pretty interesting scale to be working out as well, so uh, we see a lot of that type of scale and opportunity. Um, partnership with educational institutes, uh, Sean talked about Surrey and SFU. Uh, we also have a lot of you know, Prince George and UNBC, the uh, city of Vancouver and UBC, Burnaby and BCIT, really looking at those uh, community and educational institute partnerships. And uh, also ideas competitions, something that Surrey was doing again to generate ideas and opportunities in your community. The third motivation why it seems local governments are interested in playing a role here is uh, to have some corporate income stream. And we see that some local governments want to open and operate uh, these systems and some don't. And it really depends on the business case for the project. Uh, as a local government, you might be eligible for grants that you wouldn't be getting if you're uh, just a private organization. Um, and also the confidence of the, uh, yeah, the confidence of the uh, local government to be able to take these projects on. Some say, you know what, this is not our core business, we don't want to have anything to do with it, we're looking for a private utility to, to lead that through. Others are saying, you know what, D doing a utility business is pretty much something that we're very used to, we use sewer, water, etc. so it's something that we'll take on. And uh, so these are examples of, of projects uh, that, are gener that have been currently owned and operated uh, by the local governments and have a, uh, an income stream in. Uh, the one on the bottom right is particularly interested where local governments are looking at resources within their own community and how can we recapture those, those things that they're already managing, whether that's uh, putting um, uh, microhydro on the dams up at, uh, at uh, Capilano and Quitland Dams, that's what the Metro Vancouver is looking at, to be able to generate electricity from an existing resource, whether it's taking waste products, whether that's uh, wastewater treatment or sewage heat recovery or, or waste to energy, how can we take those existing products and be able to generate uh, energy for them for, uh, for jobs, for income, for uh, greenhouse gas? And the final motivation uh, that we see is around addressing energy resiliency issues. This is particularly in uh, smaller communities or communities on, say, Vancouver Island where they have quite a few outage issues. And so we're seeing quite a lot of interest from those communities to how can we use local resources to generate electricity in our own communities to potentially offset those outage issues. Now, it's got a couple of photos here from Port, Halbert, Port Hardy, which is looking at biomass, to Fino, which is looking at wastewater treatment, I can say houses, we're looking at microhydro. So what are local resources that can be used locally uh, to be able to reduce uh, energy uh, vulnerability uh, for outage issues that are coming through? So those are the local government motivations uh, that uh, we've, we've, we've uh, observed and uh, tried to work with them on. I just want this is my last slide, and I just want to point you to a, a public process that's uh, just opening up, uh, and that's around BC Hydro's uh, draft integrated resource plan. So we've had some pu uh, public consultation that started on 
uh, a couple of months ago. And we've just drafted up uh, our uh, latest version of the integrated resource plan and launched this week a series of public, session, public se sessions. So if you're interested more in BC Hydro as us as a corporation, uh, how we're looking at uh, BC's long-term electricity needs, and with, with, there's an electricity gap between what we currently have and how demand projected, uh, is projected to rise, uh, how we're looking to meet that. I'd really encourage you to look at this website and follow up on that plan to see Hydro's um, uh, the direction we're going. And as somebody who works with PowerSmart, one just interesting nugget is that uh, when I first joined Hydro about four years ago, the energy plan required that 50% of new load growth be met through conservation. A couple of years ago, that was put to 66% of new load growth, uh, and this plan talks about 78% of new load growth coming from conservation. So uh, we're constantly seeing that conservation projects remain the most cost-effective things uh, that we can do to meet that electricity gap going forward. Uh, but then in addition to that, uh, there's projects that are articulated in this plan that you might want to look at around Site C, doing renovations to some hydro's facilities, and then purchasing uh, energy or electricity uh, from some of the small projects that we've been talking about today. So I welcome your questions. Thanks for your time. Uh, my presentation is going to be made very easy because Robin covered off a whole host of things just around kind of the drivers, but looking at it just from a biomass lens, we have a few different things. Maybe as I get into my presentation, just so I know how fast I can go with a little overview, how many of you know who the BC Bioenergy Network is? Oh, so about half. Okay, well I'll try and be fast, but cover a couple of slides. So unlike the utilities here and the cities, which are all very large employers, we're a very small organization. We have four staff. We're a not-for-profit. We were established in 2008 with a mandate to accelerate bioenergy development in the province. Uh, we received a $25 million grant from the Ministries of Energy and Environment and uh, we put in place an independent board, which does allow us quite a bit of flexibility in terms of how we work. It's kind of the best of both worlds, money from government, but independence. And our board members are largely taken from industry associations that benefit from the biomass sector, and also from the university, because the partnership aspect, as has been mentioned before, is really critical in an emerging sector like this one. So our specific mandate, we maximize the value of BC's biomass resources, we look to do mission critical research, so from universities into industry and back again. Reduction of GHG emission is critical, the networking and partnering, not just in BC but also nationally and internationally. And finally we love our funding, so that's why we know a lot about what's going on because lots of people come and talk to us because we do have funding availability. So we have kind of three core service lines. We focus on funding capital projects, pilot and full-scale commercial. And we've done 14 to date, worth about 12.94 million. That's levered almost 80 million in total project costs. We do some capacity building because we know in a young and nascent sector, there's certain kinds of activities, studies, getting capacity in certain industry sectors for people. Um, research projects that are all really critical to helping industry move along. We've done nine of those, about a million dollars. They tend to be much smaller. And finally, we do have a, a kind of public service side around education and advocacy. That means giving talks like these, we host conferences, workshops, we do them in partnership with others generally. We don't do too many things just on our own. And uh, we also try and work with uh, clients and also those who don't receive money to help them move their projects forward. So it's a, a big challenge when you talk about developing the bioeconomy. Uh, you need assertive companies, and I was glad to see so many private sector folks here tonight. You need creative communities and local government I put in there. And you need visionary policy leadership and support. And I have to give a huge amount of credit to our local governments in our cities in British Columbia. Because in my view right now, where we're at in the development of the sector, they are really showing the leadership. The bioenergy sector, bioeconomy, if you want to look at it more holistically, it gives jobs, gives economic and social development. 
environmental benefits, and a really important one for this province is clean energy export. So you have to rely on best-in-class technology and projects, integration of multiple solutions. Rob will talk a little bit about that, and I'm sure we'll hear more about the integration aspects from others. And best utilization of feedstocks. So feedstocks for bioenergy are they're waste, waste that we currently are landfilling, waste that we're currently putting on agricultural lands that already have too much phosphorus. So the idea is how can we take this waste, make it productive, reduce our overall waste consumption, disposal, and also increase revenues and reduce costs for communities. And I just have a list of the different types of waste that you see in, in municipalities across the province. Some more rural tend to rely more on the forest side. Some on the urban side are a bit more stacked onto municipal waste like landfill, solid waste, or wastewater. And here in British, or here in the Lower Mainland, of course, we have Abbotsford, Surrey area, which, which has a lot of agricultural land. So just a kind of, this is a snapshot or as a summary, I'm not going to list them all, but at a provincial level, we've had a lot of really good uh, legislation and regulation put in place to give us a framework from which to move forward in looking at clean energy projects. They're not just specific necessarily to bioenergy. We have an energy plan, a climate action plan. We have a carbon tax that has really created a driver for many of these projects to move forward. Because the one thing we have that challenges us here is we've got cheap energy, which is great on one hand, but it makes the uh, deployment of projects more challenging to make the numbers work. We've also had in place a bioenergy strategy, the ICE fund, which many of the projects have benefited from. We've got some renewable and low carbon fuel standards. Uh, BC Bioeconomy panel, the politicians behind it got up and running although they haven't done too much in the last few months. Hopefully we'll get through the election and they'll come back to it. The pre-pre-election, I like to call. Um, and finally, municipal regulation. So a lot of the bylaws that our local government are putting in place are also forcing us to get rid of waste that was being wasted and use it more productively. So opportunities and drivers, uh, Robin focused on four, so I'm not going to spend too much time on the ones she's already covered. Um, the one thing that I would uh, just add a little bit more is there are some real differences between large urban communities and smaller, more rurally oriented. So here in the mainland, we see the drivers really around climate action accord, the carbon tax, the competition to be the greenest city, I love that. Like Surrey is so out there and Vancouver's out there and it's Clash of the Titans and you got the small ones, Richmond and Burnaby and I mean this is all such wonderful healthy competition for evolution of this sector. Um, in the small and medium sized communities there's a lot more around economic diversification, moving away from rural forestry based economies, uh, also using your local biomass, lots of areas where they've got biomass just around the urban area. They need to do something productive with it. Um, they also have fire risk. And finally, I, it's not really part of an urban environment, but I do want to talk about the First Nations and remote communities. It relates to what Robin was talking about outage. Well, these communities are typically not on any kind of clean energy right now. They don't have the benefit of clean hydro. They don't have the benefit of cheap natural gas. They're on expensive, dirty diesel and propane. So there's a lot of opportunity for those communities to integrate uh, hosted economic and social benefits as well as utilization of their local resource and an opportunity to have a clean environment. So some of the challenges I, I mentioned them earlier around the low gas and uh, electricity prices that we have. Uh, fuel risk, lots of people say, do we have enough? Do we have enough biomass? Is there enough wood waste? You know, is there enough uh, chipped wood coming in from the surrounding areas? So a group of stakeholders, including BC Hydro, ourselves, a number of municipalities, got together and worked on a study to provide information around what was the availability of biomass in the lower mainland. And if you're interested in knowing uh, more details, it's a very dense document and you can find it on our website. The conclusion was for some 20 projects that are in planning stages for the lower mainland, there's more than enough, 
Beyond that, there will have to be new strategies on the supply chain, but you know, we're just getting started now. Uh, financing and business models, those are two key areas. Um, we're starting to see the municipalities more and more interested in moving to PPP out of necessity. I think they make sense because I'm not sure, in particular for new areas of technology deployment, that you want to put all the risk inside of a local government, so I'm encouraged to see there being more creativity around that. Um, lack of in-depth knowledge, again, we're at the early stages of this sector, so we don't have a lot of reference projects close by to look at. So you go over to a country like Austria, where you drive around and within an hour you'll go buy five district energy biomass-based systems. And uh, it's pretty easy for neighbor to neighbor to see what's happening, to understand what the opportunities, challenges, and the deployments are supposed to look like. We don't yet have that here. It's starting to happen. Uh, and I think in another couple of years, we're going to look very, very different. And I look forward to hearing from Anne's presentation about where Surrey's at with that. Um, and finally, we have a bit of policy uncertainty right now. I think I have a pretty green group here. So I think we are a bit at risk in this province right now of rolling back some of the really uh, innovative uh, policy leadership. So if you have a strong view on this, write to your um, MP, your MLAs, uh, write to your Ministry of Finance, put articles out. I mean, we, we are moving forward because we did take leadership and we shouldn't be scared off to maintain it. So I have to whip through five minutes. Is that five or one? I got five, okay. So I'm gonna be super fast on these. It was just to give you a bit of a flavor for what's out there. So you've got biomass heat power systems in BC. Uh, Robin talked a little bit about that. You've got small scale and district energy systems that are based on conventional or advanced combustion, as well as the more innovative technologies through gasification, like our homegrown uh, winter next Terra. Traditional combustion systems for CHP, the bigger ones that have grown out of our forest sector CHP business. Greenhouses have used them for a number of years, particularly out further in the valley. And finally, gasification systems for CHP. And it's pretty exciting what's happening out at UBC. I don't think I need to tell you about that. Um, just a quick snapshot, we have five biomass-based CE systems in the province that have been deployed, uh, smaller systems, individual or micro grid seven, and about 40 projects in planning, so there's a lot more coming down the pipe. And I will say the municipal and local government sector is leading the charge here. Um, this is an interesting project, landfill gas to electricity utilization over in Nanaimo, a real leader in the regional district of Nanaimo. This project uh, will substantially reduce their greenhouse gas reduction, and it's done as a PPP with the regional district of Nanaimo owning the collection asset and Cedar Road owning the utilization. And phase two will use a storage bladder to significantly increase the revenue so that they can control uh, the flow of the gas and get the best price for it. A second project that I'm, I'm not going to talk much because uh, Kristen is going to mention it, Columbia Shushwak Regional District and Fortis Partnership. Again, the local government on the collection side, Fortis owning the cleanup, and they will use that cleaned up biomethane and uh, put it through their uh, pipeline as part of their green gas offering. Um, this one is Fraser Richmond Soil and Fiber, or Harvest Power. The company is rebranding to its parent's name. Uh, exciting project. It'll be up and running uh, this September. Uh, same thing with the Columbia Shishwa project um, at Fortis. This one has taken green uh, lawn, uh, food and yard waste, converting it uh, to electricity using a very innovative high solids anaerobic digestion. You could also potentially take it to the next step on uh, transportation fuel, and it diverts about 27,000 tons from landfill, uh, 6,000 megawatts of electricity, and powers 700 homes through the BC Hydro Sustainable Communities Call. So this is exactly the kind of stuff that the cities want to see happening. And I do want to mention Metro Vancouver is a partner in this as well. Forgot your logo. I don't have much time, so I'm going to skip over that one. It's a bit more about taking something that was done in the forestry sector and an application in local government. We need to see more of that. Um, I just want to mention the CHP project. I think that's being deployed in the next month. Is anyone from Nextera here? 
I think it's within within the next month, which is really exciting. That's going to be the first time that we will have that type of project here. And then over on the island as well, ICC is working on organics or separated waste to transportation grade fuel uh, using three separate processes that each one individually has been done on large scale, but for the first time we're going to take it to small scale. So just the last plug, I get a commercial time here. We have a big conference happening in Prince George, June 13th to 15th. Everything you ever wanted to know about bioenergy, from what's happening in the rest of the world, sustainability, fiber supply, technology applications, um, and lots and lots of great networking. So I encourage you all um, to get out of the lower mainland and see where the trees are. <laughs> And finally, next year in 2013, there will be another big initiative uh, taking place here, the Global Methane Expo, which is a methane reduction workshop. Uh, this is going to bring in countries, I think they have around 50 countries in the developing and developed world that will be here. It's an opportunity to showcase the best of what we have in BC and also get some partnering going for international development. So I would say progress is being made, but continued leadership, commitment, and resources are all needed. Partnering is essential. Uh, development, financing, markets, public-private partnerships. And it's just, it's a race, and it's a race that I want to see us win. So thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Um, I wasn't sure how many people in the audience would actually know much about Fortis, so I... So, <laughs> I thought I'd start off with a, a snapshot about what Fortis does in the province of BC. So we're uh, the major natural gas supplier within the province, um, but we also have an electricity service area, and it's up in the Kootenay region, in the interior. And you can see on this map here, the blue area shows all the um, areas where we cover natural gas service, and the yellow is where we have the electricity service. Um, anywhere that has both, we have both, obviously. So what that translates into is, in the province of BC, we have assets uh, worth over $6 billion in operation. And we have 2,300 employees that uh, maintain and operate those systems. And we serve over a million customers in 135 communities and 91 First Nations. And best of all, we're 100% Canadian owned. So our parent company, Fortis King, is actually based out of Newfoundland and owns gas and electric utilities across Canada. So what you don't see on this slide is, uh, some of what I'm going to get into is, the areas that we're expanding, where we're taking our existing product line and we're expanding it into new areas. And some of those, um, Sandy's covered off, for example, on the biogas, but I'm going to expand even further than that tree if you But starting with our traditional uh, services. So the natural gas network has been in, uh, existing here in BC for over 100 years. And we expanded it in 2009 into Whistler. And Whistler had a propane system that was delivering its energy. So those 2,500 customers that are now on natural gas, um, the overall community is seeing a reduction in their emissions of about 15%. So propane emits about 15% more emissions than the natural gas has. So that was the first step for Whistle. They have a lot of um, activities planned to get even greener in the future, but this was a great first step. On the electricity front, we operate four hydroelectric dams in the uh, hydroelectric plants in the province. And we're currently expanding one of those plants in uh, the Wainita expansion. And that's located south of the trail. And it will add an additional 335 megawatts of electricity for the province. So it, taking those traditional lines, um, again, there are ways to green up the province by using some of that natural gas in, in ways that was sort of tested in the past, um, didn't necessarily catch on a lot but is seeing a lot of recognition in the future. And from the present, we actually are doing these things today. So natural gas vehicles, a lot of, um, I can't recall if it was uh, Sandy or Sean that mentioned that uh, diesel is, is quite polluting. If you convert a 
vehicle from diesel to natural gas, you can reduce your greenhouse gas emissions by 20 to 30 percent. So that's really significant given the amount of emissions we get from our transportation sector in the province. So we've collaborated with Westport Innovations, the UPC company that makes natural gas engines. Uh, Waste Tech, who many of you see in your communities picking up your garbage. And Better Transport, who operate large tractor trailers that deliver goods and services around the province to convert their fleets into natural gas. And it's not only good for emission reductions, but it's also saving these companies money. Natural gas is at a historical price, and therefore it's significantly more economical than diesel. So there's a quick payback on investing in the new technology in these vehicles, and it's very good for these companies. So renewable natural gas, another thing within our natural gas network, as Sammy said, you can take gather renewable natural gas from landfill sites, agricultural waves, waste water treatment, and create biogas. We capture, put it into our network, and it provides renewable natural gas, which is locally produced and provides carbon neutral energy. So rather than focus on the time, I'm going to tell you how you can actually get some of this for you, how you can help in this regard. So we have a residential program. So how many people in the room actually have natural gas in their homes or businesses? Okay, probably about half. So currently we've got, uh, we started a little over a year ago offering renewable natural gas to residential customers. And we've now got about 2,000 subscribers. Just since May 1st, Air Miles has introduced a new program that will incent you to add uh, renewable natural gas into your natural gas consumption. So typically it's about 10% of your overall consumption for the year. It costs you maybe about $4 more a month. But we get these extra air miles. So if you're an air miles collector, you're going to get 10 air miles a month. And if you haven't registered yet, and you register between now and July 3rd, you'll get an extra 30 air miles bonus. But we don't just want residential customers to utilize renewable natural gas. We'd like to see the commercial sector as well. So as of March 1st, we launched a commercial program for renewable natural gas. And as you can see here on the right, um, one of our first clients to take it up is the Opus Hotel here in downtown Vancouver. So they're using it to promote that, hey, they're trying to be great corporate citizens, adding renewable natural gas into their portfolio, how they get energy into their hotel. And in recognition for doing that, we're adding their name on our website. They can add coupons to give you a discount to stay at their hotel. You can get their mail on our website. We have some decals that they can put on their windows, give them additional advertising to recognize the great contribution that they're making to the community. And of course, you can see there's other early adopters, and we certainly can see other communities. We've got certain municipalities that are now taking this up. And they see how they can green up their city facilities that are utilizing natural gas. And some of those communities, they actually have landfills. So they're looking to take up most, if not all, of the renewable natural gas that's going to be created from their own landfill into either the municipal buildings or to the commercial plants that uh, reside in that community. So moving on to some some areas that are not in our traditional networks. And uh, this is what we term thermal energy systems. And here we're broadening beyond just natural gas and electricity. We're looking at other ways of producing heat or uh, power. So uh, some of these were touched on in the last few presentations. Um, and we see that we can do this either on a district scale or for an individual building on a, what we call a discrete scale. So on the left side of the screen, you see a single building, and there's a series of interconnected pipes that are reaching into the ground and drawing heat energy from the, the ground. The liquid that flows through those pipes and into the building provides renewable energy that gets replenished every year. So the sun is the heating of the ground, it's constant heat there to draw from, through the use of heat pumps and heat exchangers in the building, we can draw out that heat, upgrade it to the temperature required for the building, and distribute it throughout the building. These systems have an upfront capital cost. And in order to um, encourage more of these systems to get there, 
into new buildings and even some retrofits, we're taking on that capital cost. So as far as we see, we'll invest in that system, we'll then own and operate it, and that will enable more and more of these types of energy systems to get out there. On the district scale, uh, you can see that there's a variety of energy sources we can use, and some of them we've already been touched on. So they range from biomass to geoexchange on a large scale you can do. You can take waste heat from uh, the refrigeration of um, ice rinks. You can do that from any industry application. That's just emitting waste heat into the air. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of these. So this first one is the Hudson Building in Victoria, BC. It was a, a, reno a renovation of the existing Hudson Bay building, and they converted it to new residential units, 152, and about 150,000 square feet of commercial retail. We own the geoexchange system in this building, and by installing a geoexchange system, they were able to reduce up to 44% of the energy usage and up to 55% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a great success story. We're also doing this in the public sector with school districts. And with school districts, um, Delta being our first one, they wanted us not to look at just one building within their school district, but they wanted us to take a portfolio approach. So in the Delta school district, we looked at 19 of their facilities that all needed new energy systems. They had old aging boiler equipment, and they wanted to go as green as possible. So we looked at how we could upgrade that equipment through a combination of high efficiency boilers and geo exchange systems, and through our energy modeling and offering a utility service, charge them the same amount in energy that they pay today. So we take a look at their business as usual cost for energy. We say we're going to upgrade all this equipment, and we're going to stay within the budget that you've got today, so it's affordable. School districts are having real challenge; they don't have money to upgrade their equipment. So this is a great solution, and we're seeing many school districts sign on for this type of program. In Kelowna, this is one of several district energy systems that we're working on. We have great support from the city of Kelowna, as well as several customers along the route of uh, the line that you're seeing at the blue line, where we intend to put the district energy system in place. And also from Tokyo, the local sawmill. And that's the flame that you're seeing on the left side of the screen. That's where we'll get heat from. So in their sawmill process, they have waste heat, that we can utilize heat hot water, distributed throughout the community, and heat various buildings. And they range from municipal, municipal buildings to uh, strata residential buildings to commercial buildings. We've done our rate design. Uh, the overall system is going to cost us somewhere between 20, 20 and $35 million. And we're currently about to submit our application to the BCUC that will approve the rates. So that's an important aspect of uh, Fortis's offerings in these areas. And that is that the energy rate that we charge to customers is reviewed by the third party utilities commission here in the province. So they ensure that we're charging a fair rate for energy and everybody is on a level playing field. So we think that's a very good model, it's very fair to the customers, and it's good for us as a company. This is my second last slide. Uh, and it shows the transition of where we see our company going in the future. So today, we are largely predominantly offering natural gas and electricity to the majority of our customers. But as we move through time, as more and more of these geo-exchange and district energy and biogas, potentially solar in the future, all get integrated into our overall product offerings, the majority of our energy will be supplied by these new forms. And we think that's a very, very, very good thing, both on an individual scale, for your residential use, all the way up to whole community scales. So as you can see, we're expanding our portfolio of energy options. We're maximizing energy efficiency where we can. We're doing this in environmentally friendly ways. We know it has to be affordable. We're doing it through a utility model where we own and operate it to ensure that you have safe and reliable service. With that, I'm going to thank Sean. Um, so as Sean said, I'm the manager of sustainability. I know in the program it said I was speaking to the district energy system, and I will speak to that, but I'm also going to do a few slides on the community energy and emissions planning process. 
because it does tie in with energy supply and buildings issues within the city of Surrey. So the sustainability charter, and, and the nice thing too is Sean's gone first and he's given you some great context, actually very helpful for my presentation and I'll be able to skip through a few things. But the sustainability charter is a vision for Surrey becoming a more sustainable city. It was endorsed, endorsed by our council in 2008 and it has a number of commitments including around climate change and energy security. In addition to the charter, um, as the city as well as a number of other cities have climate change commitments, we've signed on to the BC Climate Action Charter that commits us to being carbon neutral in our corporate operations as of this year and to build complete compact communities among other things. We also have uh, global commitments. We've signed on to something called the Mexico City Pact, which is a covenant among global cities. And um, obviously we have legislative requirements where we have greenhouse gas emission reduction targets in our official community plan. So that came from Bill 27, which was a piece of legislation a few years back. We, um, Sean referenced this as well, have uh, Mayor Watts and Council clear direction on sustainability. The charter is meant to be and is the underlying document, underlying policy document in the city. So it provides direction to all aspects of what we do. And then uh, I think Elmer and others have mentioned the clean energy advisory work uh, that the mayor had put together. So we're undertaking a number of things in the city of Surrey. You'll see that picture again of the compressed natural gas um, collection truck. But these things, I should say, too, take place throughout the organization. So within the city manager's office is my sustainability office. But the things we work on, including around the transit planning, uh, the walking, walking and cycling infrastructure happen through engineering. Um, there's obviously a role of the planning and development department in terms of walkable town centers and so on. We do a fair amount of education. I see David here and others from the BC Sustainable Energy Association. We funded a number of climate change education uh, workshops, climate change showdown workshops in Surrey schools thinking of our young population um, in the city. And then obviously district energy, which I'll talk a little bit, bit more about. So this graphic, as Sean um, went through, shows you how we're bringing together a number of the things that we're doing around energy in, in Surrey. So corporately, on the clean energy business side and the community action side. And I'll focus right now on the district energy. I'm glad that Kristen had a graphic on district energy, so I don't need to spend a lot of time on this, and I have to say in preparing the presentation, I got so mixed up on heat pumps and heat exchangers that I'm glad she's already spoken to it. And, and I should say too, I'm a policy person, so uh, mostly what I'm bringing to you today is from that perspective. But uh, district energy, you know, a network system of energy to multiple buildings. So in the city of Surrey, um, the graphic that you have, or the map that you see there on the right, I don't think I have um, a laser pointer, but you see the very tiny map in the far right there is the city, and then the red square is the city center. I think Sean showed a map of that earlier. And then you see three cir circles, uh, which are nodes, representing uh, the Gateway node, the Surrey Central node, and the King George node. And what that reflects is a um, district energy strategy that we developed with funding from Hydro and Fortis a couple of years ago, where we really started to look more seriously at the opportunities for district energy in the city centre. You can see the population projections that we have there over the next 30 years for residents and employees. And you saw some of the uh, pictures as well, uh, representations of what we expect the city centre to look like as it grows over time. So we started to look at this more seriously. We've um, focused in on the Surrey Central node, where we're building a new city hall, and we have a new city centre library. We're building a civic plaza as well. So we've completed a feasibility study for that, and I'll have a few slides in a minute that shows you that system which is being built right now. We've also uh, are about to complete a feasibility study for the King George node. So it kind of as an overall picture, it just shows you that we're taking a nodal approach we're looking at opportunities throughout that area, and particularly starting with the Surrey Central Node in the Civic area, the Civic Center area, but looking at opportunities to expand the district energy system south to the King George Node. So the City Center District Energy System, uh, I mentioned the new City Hall. There's a picture of it, a representation of it in the photo on the right, and um, a graphic that shows you how that's intended. What we're doing is we're building that district energy system. It's based on a geo exchange.
exchange technology. So we're using heat pumps to extract the energy from the ground, and it's happening underneath the parkade that we're building for New City Hall. So we extract that energy, and then we use the energy to heat and cool the building. So it's a fairly discreet project, but it's Surrey's first investment in the district energy system in an integrated um, energy system. And I think I mentioned it's for the new city hall, the city central library, which is built, and that you can see in the photo there. And then um, we're expecting and hoping to connect a third party development that's also going up in that area, which will be a high rise development. But I think those discussions are still ongoing. You can see um, in terms of the status, it, the new city hall is being built. So when they were putting the parkade in, they put, started putting in infrastructure for the district, for the geo exchange field. And, um, an odd little tidbit is that I guess um, they're using some kind of drill that only, we only have seven feet of um, leeway in the parquet levels, and I guess they're bringing in some special drill that drills within that amount of headroom, which to me is pretty amazing. But you can see the piping's gone in there. To um, design and construct and own and operate and maintain the district energy system, the city is setting up a corporation. So Surrey City Energy will be the corporation that does all that. And it will be owned and operated out of the engineering department within the city. It's meant to be uh, the first, I said, in that, in that kind of discrete project, but one that can expand. And, and I think it can expand in two ways. It's really um, starting with the geo exchange with the natural gas boilers for backup and peaking. But we do see it expanding to integrate renewable energy sources over time. And uh, we do see, I mentioned this, expanding over time as we get enough customers south to the King George Road. So I won't spend a lot of time on this one either. In the middle is that civic center area with the plaza, which is a large civic plaza that's being built in the middle. But this just shows you some of the um, analysis that essentially that we're looking at opportunities within that Surrey Central node. It's mainly a residential area, so there, in each node there's kind of different characteristics and different opportunities. But in the Surrey Central node, it's mainly a residential area outside of that civic area and, and Central City um, Plaza. And um, when I say we're trying to integrate over time renewable kind of low carbon energy sources, the leading candidate at this point is really biomass, um, and particularly looking at urban wood waste, so uh, waste left over from demolition construction and land clearing construction, DLC. So that's the leading candidate right now. This also I won't spend a lot of time on, but it just looks at the King George node. And I think one thing I will comment on at the King George node is um, it has a, a bit of a different opportunity, a really interesting one that relates to Surrey Memorial Hospital. Uh, major hospital we have in the city. They have a fair amount of waste heat, so right now through our engineering department we're talking with them about opportunities in terms of this node, the district energy system that would expand to this node using that waste heat to bring in initial customers at that node and then ultimately um, integrating a low carbon energy source, for example biomass, and then um, ultimately Surrey Memorial Hospital would sign on as a customer once we have that low carbon fuel. So it allows us to use the waste heat, which was referenced earlier, um, but in terms of the challenges of district energy systems, which I'll speak about, it allows us to get get new customers, initial customers signed on, just using, starting with the waste heat. So these are, uh, I don't, uh, I won't review these, but renewable energy sources, and I've mentioned that biomass is really the leading contender at this time for the long term renewable energy source. So there's a number of benefits of district energy and some of them have been referenced already. There's certainly broad kind of high level benefits. There's benefits to customers that I'll get to in the next slide. Um, I've mentioned the multiple thermal energy sources, the ability of the system to integrate other energy sources, um, the greenhouse gas reductions, the increased efficiency, which I don't have up here, but I understand it's quite a lot more efficient compared to conventional heating and cooling. Increased energy security, it has lower life cycle costs, and um, particularly in Surrey, we're interested in the local job creation aspects of a district energy system. And I think those are uh, jobs that would be created in the utility itself, um, kind of building it, designing it, and building it, and so on. But also, if you look at opportunities around biomass and construction waste sorting, that would probably be more within the region. There'd be spin off uh, employment opportunities associated with that. And certainly um, a major benefit is, is energy dollars reinvested in the local economy. In terms of customers, um, I'll focus here really on the reliability of service, 
Um, the reduced operating and maintenance costs, the, the buildings that, you know, if we're looking at high-rise towers, stay in the city center area in the, in the eventual expanded system, those buildings would no longer have equipment in the basement. They would be centrally located in, the, in kind of that hub. So their cost of operating and maintenance over time are reduced. And, and reduced volatility and kind of vulnerability to um, energy fluctuations and energy prices. My next slide has a graph that just kind of speaks to that. I mean, I think, I think there's certainly a number of different projections around energy pricing, but there's a fair amount of uncertainty. And with the district energy system, we're much uh, better able to, to predict where those can go. So some of the challenges, obviously, there's benefits to customers, there's overall benefits to the community, to the city, but there are challenges. Uh, securing customers, which I've talked about, there's a, a definite capital cost premium of hydronic um, hot water heating. The long-term operational costs are not considered when you're when you're looking at implementation. And I think another challenge, looking at the types of development we have um, in Surrey and I think elsewhere in the region that have electric baseboard heating installed in, in more of the high-rise developments, that electric heating would pre preclude future DE compatibility. And by that I mean that it's, uh, I understand it's very expensive to retrofit um, for, to hydronic systems once you have those already in place, the electric heating. Systems. So I don't mind doing my time. Doing okay, good. I don't have any warning signs yet. So that's just a really high level overview of our civic center, mainly district energy system. And in terms of the energy shift platform, I'll talk a little bit about. I've kind of captured it under the community action, but we are building, um, developing a community energy and emissions plan. Uh, again, we have um, gracious funding from BC Hydro for that. And it's a 25-year plan looking at uh, the OCP, or Official Community Plan, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Targets, which are 33% uh, per capita reduction in community-wide GHGs by 2020, and an 80% per capita reduction um, in GHGs by 2050. So very ambitious targets, and uh, the Community Energy Plan is essentially helping us figure out how we're going to meet those targets. We've talked already about the growth. Uh, we've done some projections to 2040 for population and job projections. And as you can see, fairly impressive growth that's expected. And we know our energy, we know our, basically our emissions profile, our energy use profile. Essentially in Surrey, a little over 60% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation and about 30% from our buildings and a very small sliver from waste. We also, in the context of this plan, are looking at our energy expenditures. And we know now we have about a billion dollars that's spent on energy in Surrey um, currently, every year. And that's about, um, I'm trying to remember the number per capita, but it's, um, I think it's about $1,300 per capita. We're projecting that, I should say, to double uh, in the coming years. So by uh, 2030, that's projected to double. So per household, actually it's per household, sorry, we'd go from 1,300 to 2,600. We look at, uh, we're also looking at energy vulnerability, and um, I'm not sure, you know, I won't get into this a lot, but I think if you're looking at energy costs, one of the things that we're discovering is that uh, looking at the households in Surrey that are paying more than 10% on energy spending, right now it's very small, but with rising energy costs, that's expected to um, rise beyond median income. So it's an issue from a social sustainability perspective. So in, in terms of this community energy, energy shift, this community energy plan that we're doing, we launched it last year. We have a whole process of stakeholder engagement, working with staff and council. We have a good sense of where our emissions are right now. We've done some um, scenario modeling, all of which will help us develop really a preferred path. So how are we going to meet these GHG targets? And it'll cover land use, transportation, waste, energy supply, electricity supply, and demand, and so on. We have a website that we've developed, a microsite for engagement. Here's just a little graphic showing you some of the, the modeling, um, the inputs to the modeling. So it's fairly involved modeling that we're doing with uh, HB Leonard Holder. And in terms of the issue today, in terms of community scale energy development, that community energy plan is looking at buildings, uh, renewable energy strategies. So what we, uh, what are the range of what we can expect or plan in terms of efficiency improvements in houses? So what are the retrofit opportunities? We're looking at renewable energy deployment rates. And in terms of district energy in particular, we've uh, estimated, uh, we've come up with maximum and estimated DE 
connected floor space. So looking at different land use features, what we can expect the, the range to be, and uh, the contribution of that to building um, building side greenhouse gas reduction targets, so tons of CO2 avoided a year. But that's really a quick summary, and I think I've made it within my time. I got through all my slides, which is awesome. And I look forward to the panel discussion. Thanks for listening. There's something called the net metering program. So if you're at zero to 50 kilowatts, you can connect to the grid, build your project, sell your excess energy to BC Hydro, and it costs you $600. If you want to build something a little bit larger, get some economy of scale, you have to apply to what's called the standing offer program, the SOP program. The problem with this program is it's extremely expensive to interconnect to the grid. So if you want to build your 50 kilowatt project, you pay $600. If you want for projects that are built by municipal governments and funded by grants. Um, I just want to see what your guys' thoughts are on that. I have more information and I have a, a, a list of questions from people's emails. The BCUC is, is ruling on this issue, uh, net metering and, and SOP right now. Uh, they've made a ruling already and they're, it's going to be examined in the future. Um, so I'm just looking for support for changing its policy, changing net metering to allow net metering to be larger, up to half a megawatt, which is what's being done in Ontario, Alberta, Nova Scotia, and many other jurisdictions in the states. Um, yeah, that's my spiel. And if you guys want to comment on that, if you want more information, that's all. Thank you. Um, you know, it's a tough issue. Our government has decided that they want to maintain low uh, electricity rates and to build many of the renewable energy projects you need higher rates. So we have this problem here in this province. So yes, you, you can certainly let your voice be known, but personally I don't think it's going to be a race for you to win right now. One area where it's kind of interesting is the development of new technologies. Um, you know, currently under one megawatt combined heat power gasification systems, there's maybe anywhere from 5 to 20 out there that are different stages of development. And those kinds of systems are showing actually quite a bit of promise, but they're not there yet, so we're in this catch up. The uh, Cedar Road project didn't quite hit 1 megawatt, it was 1.6, but it was pretty close. And that project was done through a combination of the right technology, uh, incredible entrepreneurial risk taking that I think a larger size project would not have. And a lot of learning, you know, if you see Hydro, some credit, it was a challenging process to go through the interconnect uh, with a smaller project because they're a big utility and they're not, they have not to date been set up to do smaller size projects. But I think there was a, a, a lot of lessons learned there. And the second project went faster, the second engine, sorry, went faster than the first. And what that entrepreneur has done in order to make the 10 cents standing off the rate actually work is to put in place another technology solution, a bladder that would allow him to collect more of the gas and not release it until the peak rate, which is slightly higher, came in. So, you know, your comments are fair ones, but there's a whole host of pretty complicated issues in there. And I don't know if Rob wants to say that. Uh, no, not really. I mean, uh, again, uh, I think you've given some good policy context for us um, around electricity rates. Um, so, yeah, as somebody from Power Smart, uh, we often have people say the best thing you can do is raise your rates uh, to make conservation uh, a more desirable thing to do. Uh, but uh, raising electricity rates isn't something that's uh, been very politically palatable. Um, so, uh, that certainly restricts our ability to. Uh, so, it's certainly cost effectiveness is a, a key criteria that we're managing to at the moment. I think it's reflected. I'm not sure about your staff, but there's been no projects. Uh, linked up, and, uh, but I don't have any offhand for you. I just know projects that have been uh, talked about. I know that some are in the, in the pipe, for example, with Metro Vancouver, uh, taking for the signing up the program of some of their initiatives. Um, but I can follow up with you afterwards um, to direct you to, some, to somebody who can tell you more about those projects. But certainly, I know it's a, uh, a challenge. Sure. Well, I'll echo Sandy's comments. Um, it goes for all new types of pro energy projects. 
it, it takes time to get to that stage of being able to have it mainstream. So while it's not mainstream today, I have faith that in the future we're doing some projects which we anticipate will be combined heat power. We need to connect to the BC hydro grid in those areas where we don't have, um, or we're not the electricity service. So with time, I believe it will all get there. It's just a matter of we're in a new, a new energy environment and we're all trying to get there. Can I just make one follow up on it? It's, it's, it's not actually the price, it's the barrier. It's mostly the interconnection. And there's really a disconnect there between the small estimated price from hydro of $10,000 for 50 kilowatts. And then all of a sudden you just go to the SOP people and then it's orders of magnifier. So that, that's it. Thank you. Just um, one second. We had a question. Uh, yes, before the Q&A session, we pointed out that the developers are not enthusiastic about spending more money to make a more efficient building or a higher, lower cost. Of and that's because the developer doesn't have, doesn't get any return from any reduced operating costs. Is there any consideration about factoring or uh, putting some future uh, context so that the developer has an incentive in reducing the operating costs? To give them an incentive to build buildings which are more environmentally sustainable. That's a great question. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Start. Um, that the developer is not the resident in the future. So having that sort of incentive does not incent the developer. That's my point. Like, is there a way that that could be factored in? Yeah, I, I, I think from our experience, what we're seeing is, as we're seeing more forward-thinking developers put in alternative energy and say that we're willing to take on that cost, and through our marketing, explain why this is a better uh, building to buy into, even though it's a slightly higher price. Following that, we're seeing other developers that are having to compete and doing the same thing. So I think that is a more powerful influence. What we're seeing in some yeah, sure. The only thing I'd uh, add is that there's many different types of developers, and we've had a lot of success around developers who are ending up uh, owning and operating those buildings, or malls, or whatever those those uh, uh, factors are. Uh, where they've got, um, if they're going to be uh, ending up uh, paying energy costs going forward or offering it to their their tenants, uh, they certainly have a lot of self-interest. Whereas if you're uh, building and selling, you're not sort of linked in that as a split incentive. Uh, we do have a new construction program. Uh, as a power smart new homes, which works with uh, new building developments, uh, to be able to provide incentive towards more energy efficient um, buildings. And I can, again, I can follow up with you around those two programs uh, following. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Just one line I mean, political leadership can mandate that it happens. So it's a good segue because I, I didn't forget to mention that one thing we're exploring our, our council of Surrey in terms of the City Centre District Energy System has asked staff to develop a draft bylaw for their consideration to mandate connection to the district energy system in that area. And um, I know that in Lonsdale, the um, City of North Vancouver's done something similar. I'm not as sure about other jurisdictions, but it's something we're exploring as a mandate to have hydronic system installed in your building and to connect to the district energy system. I just want to add one more thing. Um, we've got incentives to BC Hydro, like the new construction program, Power Smart New Homes. Uh, one exciting new development that we're pursuing is uh, marrying our incentives with local government uh, incentives that they have around green building policies. Uh, so we're doing some really interesting work with Surrey, City of North Vancouver, Vancouver, uh, and other communities around what tools the local governments have to advance energy efficiency. They can't require it to build above the building code, but they've got some really powerful incentives that they can offer, like density bonusing, like uh, uh, building permit rebates, uh, expedited permitting, etc. And we're looking to see how we can marry their incentive with our incentive as well, uh, to make it even more desirable for developers to be pursuing energy efficient buildings. And then from a, a building code perspective, a lot of local governments used to say to me, Ron, why would we uh, try and get uh, more energy efficient buildings in our community? We'd be better to lobby the province uh, to raise the building code. 
sort of promises kind of raisability code until you've got a, a market penetration of about 15, 20, 30 percent of the uh, new buildings being built for that higher standard. So we can work with local governments and developers and uh, folks like yourself to be able to uh, drive that uh, penetration of energy efficient buildings so that it gives the, the provincial government the confidence to be able to uh, put those kind of higher energy standards in place. Yeah, thanks, and then I'll just uh, one comment that I'll make is that um, I know that uh, the developers most likely are looking for, and we've got great developers and developers that are in North Bend and, and they're working in Surrey now, so they kind of they already understand the system, but they're really looking for, I'd suggest, a level playing field so that if they have a product on the market, um, they want it to be a like for like, uh, aside from you know the unique attributes of what they're building, um, a level playing field. So if there's a you know one apartment on you know X number of square feet is X amount of dollars, they don't want uh, their product because they've got a DME system connection to be X plus because then all of a sudden their, their product isn't as competitive. So I would suggest that a level playing field is uh, all of a sudden makes it a lot easier. Um, the challenge is do you actually do you pull a policy lever to force a connection um, or do you try and work with the developers on going to get to that point uh, themselves? So we are having that discussion in the debate right now. And next question. Uh, what's the average um, uh, household energy, uh, sorry, household uh, solid waste worth as a proportion of the annual uh, household energy use? Hey, Paul, are you here to know your answer? Metro Vancouver, is that the Okay, if I can give an anecdotal chat, isn't the type of waste you're probably thinking of, but in sewer heat recovery, you need three households worth of sewer heat to heat one home. So if you're talking about that other type of waste, that would be your issue. When you're talking about those discrete systems, they say you have an individual apartment building or something like that, um, would you have a uh, sewer waste heat recovery plus a solid waste uh, gas generation facility? Would you tend to have both of them or just one? Uh, we haven't done one like that. It all depends on economics. So our goal is to make it affordable to the end user. And if the economics work by a combination of systems, then that's definitely a, an option. At the moment, you know, we can make geo-exchange economics work. Um, sewer heat recovery more often in a district energy system makes sense. So it, it depends on the cost of the technology. Um, the, the sort of in the biomass world, the combinations that are more popular in Europe are biomass with solar. So solar isn't very firm, biomass is firm, but you can get more out of the system by combining the two. So. I'm sorry, I don't have any lease for household figures. Finally, I heard the S word, solar. I haven't heard anything about that in any of these things. I see in all these slides, rooftops of buildings and everything else, and we're looking at the heat from the ground, but not the heat coming from the sun. Where's the solar? Yeah, yeah. Just, I, you know, in our energy plan at the last slide that I had, I was saying what we're looking at in terms of buildings, and one of the things we're looking at is kind of what the range of, I said, retrofits, but also renewable uptake. So particularly the solar hot water, uh, heat pumps and other things, but solar hot water focused on what would we anticipate, what do we want to achieve in Surrey in terms of uptake of renewables, and that's for us, that's where solar is coming into play in, the, in that plan. Yeah, it wouldn't be just solar hot water, but solar, solar as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, we've looked at solar for some projects. Again, the economics haven't worked for us at this stage. There's a lot of advancements happening in solar, so we're constantly watching it. Uh, but there is an organization, if you're not aware of it, called Solar BC, that does a lot of incentives in that, in that regard, and is trying to get more solar out there. I think it's just more of a matter of time, time, cost, factors. Yeah, I think that's the biggest balance that I've uh, not seen thus far, or, or uh, heard anyways, the, the cost to actually implement relative to what you're getting sort of right now. And, you know, over time, the scale will tip and it will become more viable. 
Uh, Dan Fields, the Joint Executive Assistant. This question is directed at Surrey, so anybody can take a question on Surrey. Uh, again, uh, you touched on the solar uh, aspect of solar PV. Uh, the cost has been down 75% in the last three years in solar. So it is affordable. It's cheaper than coal. Um, so again, I was approached in a previous job by uh, a public works government service Canada is building 500,000 square foot building in downtown Vancouver. And one of the objectives they want to do is want to be net zero electricity. So they're talking about, again, generating more electricity using solar, storing it in batteries in the basement. And this was going to be all incorporated in construction of the buildings to start in 2014, finish in 2017. So again, in your future planning for your buildings, uh, is if you're planning to have it LEED certified uh, to be net zero uh, in your time, so that the factory generates much less energy as you're consuming. So, for those who didn't hear, the uh, question was a continuation on uh, the solar panels and uh, what are the, the city's plans to integrate solar into the building and development that's going on? So, um, I, I don't know yet, I guess is my answer, because we're just in the midst of developing that community energy plan. Uh, certainly, the you know among the staff and the stakeholders and, and definitely our consulting group, there's a high knowledge, uh, particularly from the consulting side, of the net zero um, building issues and requirements, so it's something we're still exploring, but I, I can't, I can't answer because I don't know right in the midst of it. Yeah. I just want to uh, yeah, just refer people to the Interior Resource Planning uh, website as well. We've got some cost comparisons across the province uh, around technology at the moment, uh, which is indicating why uh, solar hasn't really been adopted in BC for electricity apart from some of these uh, demonstration projects, and you know, comparing the cost uh, of micro hydro or, or wind and some of those other technologies that are right now at the moment. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, my question is about uh, bioenergy. Uh, I've heard a lot about from uh, you know the panel here and then kind of about the industry um, that it's kind of like the leading low carbon uh, option right now. And I want to, I guess, my question is: is do you see that continuing, or do you see it kind of as a transition? Because talking about how bioenergy is kind of limited in Metro Vancouver, it's kind of abundant right now, but eventually we're gonna, you know, as we put these plants in, we, you know. The wood's going to get farther and farther away, or we're going to use up all of our waste. Is there, you know, a tipping point where we start looking at others? Do you see a, a, a mix in the future between geo and solar and biomass, or kind of what, how do you see it going long term? How do you see this? The biomass part, and then I'll ask my esteemed colleagues up here to do the broader. Um, we have a lot of wood waste that right now goes into the landfill and through some of the forward-looking policy making that's happening at local government, that will be diverted. So there is already existing private sector companies who are providing a fairly good supply and there will be more. So for quite some time, we're not going to have any issues around having sufficient biomass. At a certain point in time, uh, depending on how many more might get built and say 20 on the planning scale, and I'd be surprised to see 20 done in the next 10 years, quite frankly, because it's very location specific. Not every site lends itself to a biomass energy system. You know, people are interested in it, there's some good drivers that are, you know, people are getting interested in it, but it's not necessarily the only solution in town. So will all those projects out there that are being looked at in that biomass, it's hard to say. We also have a huge amount of biomass up against the North Shore, which is a fire hazard and needs to be collected, so that's another source. There's community trimmings uh, from the Park Service, and there's a lot of biomass in the sort of merit area and up into the interior, some of which is being collected now, um, the residuals. And let's be very, very clear, we're talking about waste here, we're not talking about cutting down trees. So I think it's going to be quite a long time before we see the feedstock side uh, run out, if you will. But what is more necessary is developing a commercial supply chain. So we have a couple of companies uh, in the lower mainland who are providing some of those services, Urban Wood Waste, which is now owned by Harvest Power, uh, which also have the high solids anaerobic digestion facility taking the organic waste. Is an example of a company who's putting in a lot of their own financial resources to build the infrastructure to be able to do that supply. Lead Corp has recently added a marine transportation business. 
and they're bringing in uh, wood chips from other areas by barge. So we need to see those other accompanying infrastructure elements come together as well. And who wants to tackle the, all the rest of the goods up there? Do you want to talk about the green equity? Yeah, I would echo all of Sandy's comments. And um, from a utility perspective, when we look at something like biomass, uh, there are uncertainties in the futures, and our models are typically 20 year models. So if we think that there's a risk of that supply either going away or the price increasing too much, we'll have a backup option that we can replace it with. Within the model from day one, knowing that if there is you know, lack of supply or price impact, we've got another option. Okay, we have time for one more question. So there's one at the back. Just kind of stand up uh, for the front. Yeah. So I need to kind of get some of the other things that were said, but uh, I've been involved with about 20 uh, projects in Europe make a lot, electrical generation, grid connected, uh, all solar PV, uh, only a few of them demonstration projects. Uh, but we actually haven't had a problem with connecting BC Hydro. There's usually been more problems with the municipality, and we tend to find that things like building permits and regulations like that are way behind what uh, municipalities and places like California are doing. So I wanted to give you something from Surrey to comment on things that they're doing to try to make it easier and more in line with other cities uh, with those type of programs. Yeah, no, that's, that's a fair point. I think uh, there's definitely a lot of other jurisdictions that we can learn from. We look to examples in the U.S. We look to Vancouver. I mean, frankly, I think Vancouver's done a number of things within their green building strategy. Um, unfortunately, my answer again is that we're in the midst of a community energy plan, and what I expect to come from that will be a green building strategy that will outline, um, you know, initiatives and things relating to like incentives, whether it's around building permit reductions. I mean, Robin was mentioning some of the some of the tools that local governments can have. I know um, I, I I can see your your point, and I know, for example, there's a group that's building a passive house in Surrey. It's the first passive house that's being built there. And, um, you know, they're, they're very uh, frank with us and, and we're doing the best we can, you know, within our building review uh, process. But I know it's been frustrating for them because it's a new thing for us. And so our inspectors and our reviewers are learning about these technologies and about um, different there's issues around standards and so on. So it's, it's a learning process for us. And I guess there's there's more to come in terms of um, the green every building strategy within Surrey. Yeah, yeah I'd, uh, I'd say I had an opportunity to tour the um, Army House in, in uh, Burnaby, and um, that they expressed similar challenges. It was it was the uh, even though uh, the city was well aware and on board and supportive, it was challenging when it came time to inspection for these alternative systems because there was no reference point. Um, and so as, as we see more of these come on um, and we work uh, within the BC Building Code and within the local government charter and bank of resident, their own community charter, which affords them a bit more flexibility, um, which is fantastic, we'll be able to learn from these and I think we'll be able to see an accelerated uh, development of alternative, of alternative energy solutions for home. Um, and uh, that's only going to benefit uh, all of us, so it's uh, kind of... Um, hold on, it's coming, um, but there is a bit of a, a catch-up time frame, absolutely. Um, so before I turn it back over to Elmer, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to our, our panelists this evening, and I'd like everyone to keep going around the applause.